I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, this is my first ever live, so, and I'm running on zero sleep. <laughs> so uh, hopefully it comes across okay. And I uh, wasn't really sure how I was gonna do this book club in the first place, but I thought this was a good first way to try maybe. And hopefully in the future when we have more of these, if you guys love books and you like discussing them with other horse people, um, this is something that we can do maybe in the future. Um, but I'd love to get more opinions instead of just my own. But since this is pretty much my own opinion, uh, just take it with a grain of salt. But um, I'm Misty. I'm the editor-in-chief of On The Bit magazine. And one of the things that I love to do with my magazine every quarter is to put four books uh, in the magazine that I think that would be good reading and that other equestrians have requested requested or just said that have been good and I put them in my magazine so uh, this is the page in the magazine this is the summer issue 20 summer 2022 and the book that we're going to be talking about today is this one the hearts of horses by Molly Gloss and um I'll just read the synopsis here real quick it's an elegant, heartwarming story about the profound connections between people and animals. In the winter of 1917, 19-year-old Martha Lesson saddles her horse and heads for a remote county in eastern Oregon looking for work gentling wild horses. She, chance a little <laughs> she chances on a rancher, George Bliss, who is willing to hire her on. Many of his regular hands are off fighting the war, and he glimpses beneath her showy rodeo garb a shy but strong-willed girl with a serious knowledge of horses. So begins the irresistible tale of a young but determined woman trying to make a go of it in a man's world. Over the course of several long, hard winter months, many of the townsfolk witness Martha talking in low, sweet tones to horses believed beyond repair, getting miraculous, almost immediate results. It's with this gift that she earns their respect and a chance to make herself a home. And um, here's the book. Here's my copy of the book. It took me a little bit to actually get into this one. Um, you know, they say not to let a, or not to judge a book by its cover. I actually liked the cover and I really liked the book. It just took me a while to get into it. And I think that Molly Gloss has a really great way of kind of describing her character. She goes into depth a lot. And um, the one thing that I really like in a book is that you can kind of put yourself in the character's shoes in some way, whether that's the main character or supporting characters or whoever. You can kind of identify who you kind of are in the story. Um there are discussion questions at the back of this book, and which I liked. I didn't know there would be, so after I finished it, I was going on because there's a little interview with the author in the back of the book, and there were discussion questions. So um, I picked a few. I didn't want to go through all of them because I didn't want this to be five hours long, uh, especially going on almost 24 hours of zero sleep. Um, so... Um, basically, the book is about uh, a young girl, Martha Lesson, who um, sets off from home in search of a better life, basically. Her father's abusive. Um, she kind of doesn't want the same life as every other woman in that time period, which in 1917, if you were a woman, you were pretty much expected to just raise kids and clean house, like keep house and have dinner on the table when your husband came home. And her heart was kind of wild. She didn't want that kind of life for herself, which is fine, you know, but in that time period, it was very strange. So um, the discussion questions that I chose, <laughs> because I've been up for so many hours and I knew that I would flub my way through this probably, and I didn't want to do that. 
I wrote down my answers. So um, by all means, if you're watching this at a later point in time, I'm still going to be uh, watching for comments and um, discussion. So if you have an opinion on the book and you've read it and um, maybe you want to answer one of these questions yourself, by all means, uh, jump in, comment. Um, you know, this magazine is, it's for you guys. It's for the everyday equestrian. And I just thought that this would be something fun that would be positive to kind of do together. So by all means, if you have an opinion or something, uh, go ahead and jot it down. And I will see you. So question number one was, um, Martha had set out from Pendleton, meaning to live a footloose cowboy life and see the places she'd read about in Western romances. She hadn't come down to Elwood County intending to stay. Uh, stay. What does a footloose cowboy life mean to Martha and does she find it? And um, I think originally when Martha set out from home, um, she set out for multiple reasons. One of those being to get away from her abusive father. Uh, she wanted to see more of what the world had to offer than she saw at home. And uh, she may have ended up settling in the first place she came to, but she got away from home and found a more better loving life with Henry. And uh, I think she also wanted to prove herself uh, or prove to herself and to others that she was a true horsewoman. And I think she definitely did that by the end of the book. Mm -hmm. Question two, uh, what are Martha's methods for breaking horses and how do they differ from most other people? What challenges does Martha face as a female bronco buster and how does she overcome them? Uh... Martha's way of handling horses in, is in a way, and this is just my opinion, and trying to see metaphors in the story, um, is how she wished she was treated by her father. They say that horses mirror our own internal feelings, and Martha's father and lots of other men that were just like him, they were hard and unfeeling toward any living creature, including his daughter. He shows this by breaking a horse until it dies, despite his daughter asking him to do the opposite. Actually, I thought in spite of her asking. Um, he shows his cruelness in multiple ways. Martha sees the animal as a living being with fears and anxiety just like her and works gently and consistent, consistently to bring about trust. Uh, the biggest challenge she faced was being a woman. In that period of time, women didn't have the right to even vote. Uh, well, I don't think women got the right to vote until 1920. It was a few years later than when this book is set. Um, most men didn't care for their opinion <laughs> and they were expected to be like Dorothy Romer, only expected to keep their homes and raise children. Men saw women as weak and not capable of doing the kind of work that Martha did. Uh, I think that she set off basically at a perfect time to kind of try out the world and see where she fit in it. Um, if the country wasn't at war and most of the men sent off to it, she probably would have had a harder time finding work. Um, I think the, I don't know. I, I like George Bliss's character. He sounds like the type of like kind of father figure that she wished that she would have had. Um, but even still in that time period, if she was going around asking people if they would pay her to break their horses, they probably would have said no because she was a woman. But because at that point of time since, you know, it's 1917, World War I's going on and the majority of all the men are gone to war, um, she had a better chance of finding work because there were no men to do it. Um, so I think she, the time period was perfect. Um, she kind of, I think Molly Gloss set this book up perfectly for this character. Okay. Question three, why do so many characters take notice of Martha's outfit dressing like she's headed off to a rodeo? Well, first of all, she was. <laughs> Not necessarily heading off to an actual rodeo, but you know, when you're breaking horses, you don't wanna do it in a dress, just my opinion. 
Um, but maybe I've got a weird opinion. I don't know. I was actually just talking to my husband about this the other day because we went to our county fair and way, way, way like back in those times going to the fair or going to a circus or going anywhere other than home and what you were used to seeing close around you was um, like a really big deal because they didn't have social media. They didn't kind of, you know, they didn't have a massive amount of information just completely available at their fingertips. So, um, you know, women didn't wear pants in those times. Um, to see a, a woman in something other than a skirt and a dress had to have been pretty odd for most people to see. And um, let's see. Uh, da -da -da -da. A woman wearing not only pants, but chaps had to have been something to see. But again, you can't really break horses in a dress. And one thing that I thought of whenever I saw this question was um, the show 1883. And I don't know if anybody's actually watched that show or if maybe I'm the only one. I actually didn't get to watch all of it. But uh, one of the characters in that show is kind of the same sort of female character that's sassy and uh, kind of strong-witted. And um, she just doesn't wear a dress because it's hard to, you know, take care of cows on horseback in a dress. So she gets some chaps and everybody that sees her from then on is just like kind of weirded out because a woman in that time period just didn't wear pants. Um, and then uh, there was one part in the book about a character that passed away from cancer. And this isn't actually in the discussion questions, but um, it kind of hit me kind of hard. And I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to come across very well on this because um, I think losing somebody that you love is really hard. And um, it's on page 147 and it's, um, Ruth looked toward her briefly and nodded without answering. The sympathy of her friends and neighbors felt like nothing to her. It was just a weightlessness in her arms. She accepted it because it wasn't their fault. They had nothing else for her. Nothing she could hold on to. Nothing that was any help at all. And when I read this, I um, it kind of took me aback a little bit because I think the author did a really good job of kind of explaining how you feel whenever you're going through any kind of period of grief. And um, it was kind of shocking, I think, because you don't really think about how you would describe grief in any sort of way. But I'm going to read this answer because I feel like I'm going to flub it. But da -da -da -da. Um, to lose a husband in this time period was even more so difficult as a widow because typically the man was the breadwinner and provided the wife a home, um, money to eat, put food on the table. So you're quite literally getting the rug pulled out from under you because you're left with no way to provide for your family. And she, the author, did a fantastic job here putting the feeling of going through not only watching a family member being gravely ill, but the emptiness you feel after that person is gone from your life forever. It's not something you can change. They're gone. Um... The love that you experience from others during that time is very gratefully received, but the emptiness you feel in that moment of time is just so immense and all-consuming. Um, my sister, when she was 16, was in a really bad car accident with some of her friends, and her boyfriend passed away in that accident. And we never really talked about it. She always kind of just kept it hidden and I was really young at the time I was probably only 10 9 or 10 maybe um and we only just talked about it very recently but um I remember her mentioning that when you go through something that horrible there's nothing anyone can say or do that can soothe your soul in that moment because all you want is for the person you love to be back in your arms and no one can give that to you um not to say that we shouldn't extend love in any way that we can to someone who's grieving, but to do it with an understanding heart, 
knowing that person is literally lost in emptiness. Um, and they're lost in that emptiness for a little while, and they're the only ones who can pull themselves out of it when they're ready to. Um, I've never really read a book that's really just explained grief or the process of grieving someone so well. And at this point, Ruth's husband was still alive. And um, I mean, granted, he was very gravely ill, but um, it was just, it really just hit me so hard because I think we've all lost somebody and that feeling of grief is just overwhelming. And I just thought she did a, such an excellent job. I dog-eared my page because I thought she did such a good job at um, explaining that or like describing it. So that's that. Uh, back to discussion questions. Uh, because of the war, many of the German families in Elwood County are mistreated. There are grand displays of patriotism and many sacrifices are made for the greater good. How are these consequences of war similar to or different from those which occurred during the wars the U.S. has fought since World War I? And do you see a reflection of the current war in Iraq, which um, is not quite so current anymore because that's been ongoing forever? But um, I thought this was an interesting question because war makes everybody crazy. And um, it can make you look at people in a different way um, just because you're scared. So if for some reason, um, you know, we're at war with Germany, we're terrified of Germans that live in our country. If we're at war with um, Iraq, we're terrified of Muslims that live in our country. If we're at war with Japan, we're scared of Japanese people that live in our country. Um they're Americans. Uh, they have patriotism. They're here for a reason. But um, I said, nowadays, every small thing that you do or say is scrutinized. Every action, every word. It seems that whoever we go to war with, we inevitably mistreat those people in our country uh, that are of that descent. Um, in World War One, it was the Germans, World War Two, the Japanese, the war in Iraq, anyone of Muslim faith. And we automatically assume that they're all bad and shouldn't be trusted. Yet, once the next war comes along, we forget about the culture we're supposed to hate and instead hate on the next culture instead, leaving the last culture to finally pick up the pieces and move on to make a better life. Um... No matter the culture or what part of the planet you're from, there are bad apples, but that doesn't mean the entire tree is rotten. <laughs> uh, the Thedes, for example, were just trying to build a good life for their family. They worked hard. They were kind to people. Um, they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And what happened because of it? Instead of seeing them for the good people they were, they were treated poorly because of where they were from originally. Um, and their family safety was threatened unless they showed their patriotism and bought an insane amount of war bonds. So tell me who the bad apple is here. So I'm answering a question with a question. Um, tell me who the bad apple is here. The German family who were kind to their neighbors and worked hard or the patriotic Americans that threatened them. Uh, bad apples are everywhere, no matter the culture, gender, or race. Um... I'm getting a little deep here today. How am I doing so far? I don't even know. I'm more of a participator, not so much a leader of discussion. So, <laughs> and then also doing it on no sleep is, well, all right. Uh, Martha judges people by how they treat their horses. The thieves noticed she had evidently made up her mind that people who treated horses decently must be decent people. How do you form your opinion of people and what is your moral compass? I completely agree with Martha. <laughs> um, especially if it's a helpless animal. Um, I think it speaks volumes about who you are and just... Excuse me. Um, I try not to be judgy, but 
I feel like if you treat something that's helpless very poorly, you probably have poor morals and you're probably not a very good person. And you're probably gonna treat people that aren't helpless pretty crappy too. So, um, you know, I agree. <laughs> I agree with Martha in this case. Um, and that question kind of leads into the next. Martha's responsible for getting Al Lagerwell fired for beating horses. What are the repercussions of Martha's actions? Later, she repeats a comment she heard from the Woodruff sisters when she says, well, there are plenty of men who will beat a horse, but they just better not do it in front of me is all. What is the significance of this statement? Um, I thought he got what was coming to him and not soon enough. Um, in my point of view, if I had hired Al and he beat my horses, that's one thing. But if he was beating a horse that didn't belong to me, that was on my property and under my care, well, that's a whole nother can of worms. You're risking lawsuits and beef with your longtime neighbors. And especially back then, you relied on your neighbors a lot more than what you do now. Um, now, with that being said, you can't save every helpless horse, dog, cat, you know, whatever. But if I came across someone was cheating, mistreating an animal in any way, I would do whatever I could to get them and that animal to safety uh, because that's what a decent human being should do. Not only that, but in this instance, Al was undoing all the work Martha had done with that particular horse, thus wasting her time and her client's money. That would be enough reasons for him to have been fired. I thought she was brave for stepping up and doing what she did, especially being a woman, um, because... They may not have listened to her and he could have just kept going on doing what he was doing just because she was a woman and nobody cared about what her opinion was. Um, so that's what I thought about that. I really didn't like Al Lagerwell's character and I was glad to see him go. It's just like a really good show that you get into, you know. There's always the character that you love to hate, the Nellie Olsons or, you know, whoever that just... They just cause so much unnecessary grief uh, that it kind of gets annoying. And then you think of those types of people in your own life and how you can get rid of them. Because <laughs> they just do nothing but bring you down. Um, Martha and Henry's marriage feels inevitable long before Martha realizes the path she's on. Um, I saw her on it from the moment that she met Henry. I don't know how. Because uh, Molly Gloss doesn't really allude to it super, I mean, like a whole lot in the beginning. Um, what does Martha tell Henry she wants out of a marriage? And how is he able to give these things to her? What makes Henry different from most men Martha has known? You know, <laughs> when I read this part of the book, I thought this girl is wise beyond her years. But then I also remember that the... Um, she's a character that's being written by a woman that's wise beyond her years. So if you're young and you're reading this book, take heed, ladies. Um, Martha knows exactly what she wants out of life and who she is and wants to be. And she's not willing to change herself for anyone. Um, love is so grand and exciting that it's easy to forget who you are and what you want out of life because you get swept up in it. That is no lie. <laughs> Um, you change yourself or your trajectory that you wanted to take for the person you love. Then sometimes what tends to happen in marriages is that when the excitement of new love wears off, you find yourself wondering how things should have been and why you had to change yourself in the first place. And that just creates problems in the marriage later on. Um, if the person you love truly loves you, they will love you exactly as you are. And they won't ask you to give up what you want out of life, what you love um, and who you are. Uh, Martha had seen the type of life most women in that time lived, and she knew she didn't want that life for herself. What makes Henry so great is that he didn't force her to choose between being married to him or working with horses. He knew that it was important to her and that that was who she was, and he just wanted, wanted to integrate the two things together. So I think Henry is kind of... I love Henry's character because... He's kind of like Martha's safe place. You know, there's uh, the point in the book where Martha, there's, um, it's some a Christmas dance or something. 
And um, she said that she felt lonely in the midst of all of those people um, because she just didn't fit in with any of them. And I feel like Henry is her safe place. And just like in a marriage, like my husband is my safe place and there's things that I do and say in front of him that I wouldn't do or say in front of anybody else because I, he's, he's my safe place. He's my harbor. He's my lighthouse. Um, and I feel like Henry kind of builds himself up to be Martha's lighthouse in this book. And so when he asks her to marry him and she says that, I think she's wise for knowing exactly what she wants but he's also wise for choosing to not make her choose. Because I feel like a lot of people do that now. They, You fall in love, but then one of you has to change for the other. Um, or you have to give up something for that person, which, you know, that's fine if that's what you really want. But it should be what you really want to do. Somebody that loves you unconditionally enough to hitch their wagon to yours is not going to make you change who you are. And if they are, they're not truly in love with you, the person that you are, if that makes sense. So it's important to know exactly who you are and who you want to be and not to change that for anybody unless you want to change it. Um, and that being said, when we're in a marriage, we all change. We all grow. We all turn into different people, um, as we should. That's just the natural way of things. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, whenever you are single and you know what you want out of life and somebody asks you to change that um, because they want to be with you, do they really want to be with you or do they really love you if they're asking you to change who you are? Probably not. Okay. Mm. Martha and Henry's marriage feels inevitable long before Martha realizes the past she's on. Da -da -da -da. Oh, sorry, we already did that one. Hold on. Let me turn my page. Uh, shortly after her marriage to Henry, Martha realizes that Loving someone meant living every moment with the knowledge he might die, die in a horrible way, and leave you alone. What events in the novel led her to this conclusion? How else did these events change her? And have you ever had a similar realization in your own life? Um, watching not only Tom Candle die, but seeing Ruth go through it would have been agonizing for Martha. She's young. She's never seen stuff like this before. And her first time setting off from home, I mean, other than her, you know, witnessing her mother having the miscarriages, she's never really, she's never been in love. She's never been married. Um, she's never had somebody super close to her pass away before. Um, when I first started working in the hospital, it was easier for me to harden my heart a bit to get through tough situations. So um, I'm a respiratory therapist. And when I first started working in the hospital, I, you know, we see a lot of bad things. Sometimes we have traumas. We have um, people that code on us that lose their heart rate um, or stop breathing. And you have to work through that situation and eventually kind of build up this skin to where you're in the moment, you're doing your job, but it's a job. You know, you have to take the emotional aspect out of it or you won't be able to do your job. Um, so, you know, you build up this thick skin or you go crazy. You literally go crazy with the people that pass away or the things that you see. So, um, coding people, beating on their chest, taking someone off the ventilator when there was no hope and the family was ready to let go, that kind of stuff. It's hard and then it gets a little easier every single time you do it. Um, and then I stepped away from that, uh, you know, working on the floor, working in ICU, working in ER, uh, seeing all the stressful, bad situations. I went to outpatient where you don't really see that kind of stuff. And I was there for a really long time. 
So when I was an outpatient, that's when I got married. And I've been married to my husband for, it'll be 12 years this year. And I went, I went back to my roots. I went back to respiratory um, this year. So back into the stressful things. Um, going back into those traumatic situations, it was harder for me this time to develop a thick skin because every situation I would put myself in the wife's shoes and it just about rips my heart out every single time because I love my husband so much and I can't imagine my life without him. It physically makes my heart hurt now. Getting married changes you immensely. You are, as the Bible says, one flesh. Um, it's like loving yourself because you're one um, with that other person. And losing that person would be like losing yourself. And the longer you're married, the more intense that attachment to each other becomes. Um, just as an example, super fast, um, we had a cardiac arrest come into the ER a few months ago. And, you know, when EMS pulls in and they're, you know, doing CPR, again, you just... You just do your job. Uh, you pull the patient over to the gurney. You um, you intubate. You do all the things. You try to get the patient stabilized. You know, you, you just, you do your job. But then his wife came in. And then all of a sudden, it's like it's not a patient anymore. It's a person. And it makes it a lot harder to do your job because all of a sudden you're putting yourself into that person's shoes. So as they're standing there screaming for their husband because they know that he's not coming back and now, you know, you at one moment in time, you're someone's wife and then the next moment, you're someone's widow because that person's just gone. It just, I don't know, it it's crazy. And... um I think I'd feel the same if I was a mama and I lost my baby, you know? I don't know. That's just my crazy way of thinking. But um, you do attach yourself tremendously to your your immediate family. And losing one of them is hard. I can't imagine. I don't want to imagine. Uh, but I do. Every single time I step into the ER or I see you. Uh, so that's my story. Um, what else? How is this book about the hearts of horses? Which horses are characters and what are their roles? What else might be the title or what else might the title be referring to? Um, I said, and um, I think each horse mentioned in this book is important character because each one brings out a little more understanding of Martha uh, and who she is. It's a way to look at where your own heart stands and how you treat people and why. The title is in itself a metaphor for Martha's heart and why she is the person she is. Horses are a flight animal uh, for one to love and trust you enough to let you climb on its back and uh, tell it what to do is massively understated. If that horse trusts you, it will eventually let you in and allow you to build a relationship with it. And that's exactly how Marva is as well. So she basically is a horse. Um, that was my last question. But I thought the hearts of horses, it's Martha's heart. Martha's heart is exactly the same way. She just wanted somebody to love her and treat her uh, the way she deserved to be treated, the same way as these abused horses that she works on uh, more gently than other people. So I, I don't know. I thought it was such a good book. I wasn't expecting to really like it, especially because it was slow in the beginning. But, you know, that's just like any good book when you're really trying to get to know the characters and there's a lot of characters to get to know. And then as you go along... Um, there's more and more. So sometimes, you know, when you're picking it up and putting it down and picking it up and putting it down, it's kind of hard to immerse yourself into the story and remember. <laughs> but um, I liked it. I thought that um, I was happy that she found a better life for herself. 
she took a chance. She was brave, especially in that time period. And um, I thought it was a really good book. So, you know, that's my opinion. Uh, I'd love to know some of your opinions on this book if you've read it. And uh, hope the next time that we do this, we'll have a little bit more people to join us with their own uh, opinions because probably nobody wants to hear mine. <laughs> so that was The Hearts of Horses. Uh, I'm not sure which book we'll do next. I I think maybe Shy Boy. It's a book by Monty Roberts. So um, I'll show you the little synopsis there. Um, I think that's probably the next one that we'll do. So next month, kind of mid-month, I'll talk about that and hopefully get some of your opinions on that book. So in the meantime, though, if you're watching this and you've read The Hearts of Horses, let me know what you thought of it and what your favorite parts were. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on the flip side. Bye.